Okay, so firstly, how many people here have the mobile app? Okay, because you're going to be using it, so get it out. Um, obviously, most, most of you know me from running the MOOCs and stuff, but anyway, I've um, been working a lot with organizations on MOOCs over the last while, and one of the key things is that there's lots of different platforms out there and how people use them. So this was a bit of a, um, a study we did and sort of a look at how people are using MOOCs, and we sort of had a look at literature to understand um, the background and, and where is the evidence and the research behind it. So there's various um, MOOCs out there which are using Moodle already. Uh, I think Open to Study was already mentioned. You learn Moodle, which was run by Moodle itself. I think it's in its seventh or eighth iteration now, three to 4,000 people each time. Michael has the luxury of doing the research on that to produce some longitudinal data on how people engage. Some pretty sexy stuff in there at the moment, so we're hoping to have that soon enough. But also then, IT Sligo have been running MOOCs on Moodle. You've got other ones as well there, UCLs, um, which was mentioned already. Then across Europe, Moodle is heavily used, and one of the reasons it's heavily used is its multilingual aspect. A lot of MOOC platforms don't have 105 learning packs, or language packs, sorry, um, as for their interface. So therefore, it, they don't really work in places which are not having English as their primary language, as well as some of, um, of the alternative when you start using Moodle. And so th these are just some of the ones which are being used in the open ed MOOC sort of network across Europe. Now, um, okay, so before, we, before I go on into this part, I'd like you all to go into the mobile app, please. And I'd like that you've all been added to an extra course, which is Moodle Moot Responses. There's two choices in there, if you can all quickly do them, please. Uh huh. <laughs> Oops. Can you all see them? Yeah. One of the interesting things about using the mobile app, by the way, is the fact that we build all these web services into Moodle. And this is an example of actually doing real-time reports directly out of that platform. Mm -hmm. And so you can see here as you're all voting. So we have, yeah, so 41% are using MOOCs. It's like the same amount aren't using them. And some people just don't know. So I think that's quite indicative. At the moment, there is a huge amount of people in Europe, especially, who are using MOOCs and using very different platforms where that's actually going up, where the states, percentage-wise, is actually going down at the moment. Okay, so most people are using Moodle. Some are using FutureLearn, and no one's using edX. So it's interesting. One of the biggest challenges that I've found is the IT departments, or otherwise known as the departments of no, usually don't respond very well when you say, you know what, I know we've got 5,000 students on our Moodle site, but can we add 30,000 students just for three weeks, please? I'd like to run a MOOC next month. Usually they're not very, um, what's the word, responsive to that kind of request. But anyway, let's move, move along. So one of the things which I've, um, or, and, and what we looked at was all the different areas, what make a MOOC a MOOC when you're looking at Moodle. Um, this is great. <laughs> um, Sorry. Um, so one of the, the key things is, when you're using Moodle, you can control authentication, enrollment, and these sort of things in very different ways than other platforms. The majority of these are designed for really easy entry. They might have Google, they might have Gmail. Yeah, I've got the wrong slides. <laughs> Having a great day so far. Um, and th they use different, um, different controls than Moodle can offer, because Moodle can offer so many different other controls. You can really fine tune how you want to do it. Some people like using stuff like Eventbrite. Some people like having people sign up via Twitter and other different systems. But this was one of the areas where Moodle really does come into its own in the way that it handles content and the fact that it is very much content agnostic. The research has shown that users nowadays on MOOCs, they access their course 
in different ways than typical online courses. They access it for shorter periods and in different places. They might access it at home while on the bus. So having this concept of nano content or bite-sized learning is really important because they are only going to have a certain amount of attention for a certain period and you need to not lose them. I think FutureLearn found was about five and a half minutes for videos that, that they found that people started tuning out. And that's come down in the last five years from, or last five years from around 12 minutes. So it's been, it's been a huge change. One of the other areas that the research has shown is that forums and how you use communication and facilitation has actually got a really key thing. That if you actually are wanting to give real-time engagement that are, um, and quality feedback, the students actually respond more. I think one of the interesting things looking at Learn Moodle is that Learn Moodle has a, a lot of forum activity. I think just one of the stats when we had a look at it, half of the people who are continuing and going through it each week are just interacting with the content and with the forums and not even taking the actual assessment itself. They're just going through the learning process but without requiring that validation of assessment which is certainly something I hadn't seen in any of the other research on future learning on Coursera platforms. From assessment as well, Moodle offers quite a lot of different options for assessment, be it peer assessment with things like workplay, um, the workshop or using forums and ratings, or the full assessment using quiz and being able to be, both be formative on a weekly basis and summative at the end, or having things like SCORM. One of the, although SCORM is not often used in, in MOOCs, you can see nowadays that a lot of people are starting to use it because it gives them really complete control of how that is presented. Um, I think the work that's being done on the Mo Moodle mobile app at the moment is really innovative in having that SCORM being able to play it offline. So someone can actually go in, download their whole MOOC course, and then just do it if you go down that line. This is an interesting one. And what does it mean for student empowerment? And when you, th you think about a MOOC, a lot of MOOCs are not, not self-paced. They're lightly facilitated, um, if at all. But it's something where the student does not really have much control. They're usually phased-based. Um, some, some MOOCs have switched back and forth from being phased-based, so each week they slowly release the content or that they show it all. And there is indications currently in the research that this actually does have an impact, that students can feel overwhelmed when they see all of a MOOC content, but if they're actually just seeing it released on a week-by-week -week basis, that they have a continual engagement because it's, again, this sort of bite-size concept that they only have enough just for that week, so they're not going, wow, there's just so much content here. But as part of that, it also helps them guide their progress and track their progress because with things like conditional um, activities and uh, completion tracking or using features like the progress bar, you're enabling them to manage their time and to manage their tasks as they actually go through the course. And in a MOOC, that's really important because they need to know where they are and what they've still to do so they don't disengage. I think one of the areas here was they had this funnel of engagement and where this actually then just literally falls off a cliff. And part of that is because they, they aren't they don't know what the expectations are in what they have to achieve. And this is one of those things where you can add sort of gamified aspects to it and what is, what is the end result. So with um, that particular MOOC that um, we were to, um, I referred to where you had 50% of people who were doing the course but yet they, um, they weren't going through the assessment because they didn't feel the validation. This, if you take that with what Future Learn and Coursera and a lot of these others are doing now where they're starting to charge for the certificate. That sort of throws up a question as, what is the value of a MOOC? Now, can I ask you just a question here, and we won't use the mobile app this time. How many people here have done a MOOC? Okay. How many people here completed the MOOC? Okay. And how many people here haven't completed the MOOC? Okay, and why? <laughs> I'll, go on. Go on. I'll volunteer you. What? How? Lack of time? Anybody else? Overwhelmed by the content. Pardon? An unstructured way of learning. I, and I think 
And, but, but none of them really get into this side of it, which seems to be one of the big contentious issues. Should you issue a certificate? Should it be a badge or should it be nothing? I, and I, th I think it is interesting that there's just so many areas that people don't complete for. Um, remember one survey, we're asking people why they were doing the MOOC. And so why do you do MOOCs? Anybody? See how teacher prepared with Moodle. Okay. Having a nosy, yeah. I wonder how many in that AI MOOC at the beginning were technologists or educationists going, ooh. <laughs> I wonder what's this like. Same, yeah? Same, same how the MOOCs work. Yeah, and I think it's, um, so you really have to try and capture, if you want to understand what people are going to do and what is the end goal, is certification the goal? Or are they just going in there and is their purpose achieved without even necessarily looking at the content. They just look at it and go, hmm, that's pretty. And I've been on courses where I went, hmm, that's pretty. And another MOOC I was on, I'm a, I'm a terrible student, I really am. It was, I think I had 10 hours to complete all of the assignments on this statistics MOOC I was doing just to see how it would work. And uh, so I just did it at the very, very end, seconds before the deadline. It was, it was a good rush. I'm not sure I actually learned much, but I, I did pass, so th that was okay. And, and, and this begs the question, that if you start looking at reporting, and you start looking at, well, what statistics are you going to look at? So are you having that 50% drop-off straight away? So 100 people register, 50 people actually get into week one, and what percentage do you get to the end? Unless you really understand who these are and where they're coming from and what their motivations are, and have done research in the surveys with those people, these statistics aren't so meaningful. I mean, I've, I've helped colleges on MOOCs where they've had about 30% completion rate out of that initial cohort. And one of the reasons for that, their sign-up period and the start were really tight together, and they did that deliberately. Because if you sign up for a MOOC early and three or four months pass, you may not be interested, you might have done something else in the meantime, or your calendar and your schedule have changed so you don't have time and you're overwhelmed by the content. So what do statistics and reports mean? In the research, they're looking at exactly, the, I mean, I think, was it, was it last year? They started looking at a different way of calculating what is a completed MOOC from a student point of view. So are you going to start looking at waypoints? So are you going to say, if they have within week one, they have done these tasks, maybe or not the assignment, that they are deemed complete, so you can say, yeah, these are a fully engaged week one student. So you need to actually define at that level what you mean by a student on your MOOC to be able to get statistics and good reports. Now Moodle, obviously, with stuff like activity tracking or progress bar, you can get a certain level of those by defining them within the course. So you actually have that level of control, and you can customize it to your own personality of MOOC. And within the research, I think, one of the, the main things was Moodle uniquely offers a way to innovate. Because it is a truly open source platform, you can not just stay with what Moodle has out of the box, but you can look at customizing it and really bending it to your vision of what a MOOC should be. Because of the scalability nature and because of that open source nature, you can change it. You can introduce um, extra gamifications like the level up block or the progress bar and those aspects to really enhance the student experience and support them through that. And I think it was really interesting looking at some of the early stats on Learn Moodle from the last few years, the high level of completion that they get because of this constant engagement through forums and people are brought in a very inclusive process rather than some MOOCs which are ran in a very different way and it's nearly a hands-off. So you have a few facilitators and not much else. But has anyone got any thoughts on MOOCs? I think we have seconds left. One question maybe? Okay, I can have a question. So, two questions. Go for it. Any any thoughts about MOOCs, Moodle? Uh, I'm afraid I will shock you again, like yesterday. That's okay. <laughs> I I think I need some coffee or okay, some, some shopping. Uh, well, I've been coordinating MOOCs in Italy, and uh, we found that analytics in MOOCs are only useful if you know uh, who is. Uh, there, so uh, it's not enough to use data and uh, anonymize the data. You need to know the people you are uh, analyzing because 
they are such a lot of persons, there's such a lot of motivations for uh, being there, and many of these motivations are not completing the course. So we introduced, uh, only, always with Moodle, uh, a feedback, an initial feedback as a separate course. That's mm -hmm. a condition to get into the Moodle. So you don't have to answer to all the questions, but it's the first thing you see. It's, mm -hmm. And then you have an analysis of the population that can give you quality input to your data because uh, they are going there maybe just to see what is in there. They, they are competitors or they just want to download everything. So you cannot say uh, everybody is abandoning because they were not intended to conclude or to <laughs> obtain a certificate. So we are working that direction. And that's awesome because people who declare they want certificates, they will arrive almost there or there. And if you give partial certificates, there will be less people uh, going away. Yeah. So that's yeah. the direction. You know, and, yeah. I, I think that's a great approach. It is about finding that upfront. What are their motivations? What do they want out of the course? Hi, my name's Andrew Ferrier. I'm from uh, Greenwich and I'm just, interested in uh, the business case for MOOCs because one of the issues our university is uh, discussed MOOCs but we seem to come against a brick wall that uh, and the question we're asked is how can you monetize uh, how can you monetize them how can you justify the the time for the investment in setting up MOOCs I was just wondering if you want to comment on that okay well I'm going to horrify you it's my turn to shock yeah <laughs> those who know me won't be shocked you know I see MOOCs having two purposes, and earning money is not necessarily one of them. One, they can be used for innovation. If you have a module, if you have a course which you're running, being able to do A-B testing on two different aspects of a MOOC or different kinds of assessment strategy within that group is going to have a greater challenge getting ethical approval than with learners on a MOOC when you've got a few thousand people. You can also look at having the type of questions you do, and at scale, you can research into them. So you can actually use a MOOC to innovate in your learning. So it depends on what the purpose is. I don't think monetizing is the purpose there. However, if I was to say this as my marketing head, a MOOC is the modern day equivalent of the little booklet I got in 1989 from Trinity College outlining what that course was, what that subject was in higher ed. It was going, hey, so it's a taster. It's a taster of online education from university. So I think it's a marketing spend. So if you get one student back or two students in from that course, is, is that going to pay for itself? And I think, so monetizing it by certificate income or other things, I think is a, although lots of them are doing that, I'm not sure that's going to be a business model that will work. I think recognizing that it's a place for innovative research and also just for pure marketing is probably a better way. Sorry, we don't have time for any more questions. No. Oh. Okay. I'll ask you. Uh, okay. <laughs>